Well, thank you so much, and thanks everyone for being here tonight. This is my first time at this meetup, so I'm really excited that we're able to host it here at Asana. I'm Andrew Fiore, and I lead the data science team here. Tonight I'll be speaking a little bit about what I'm calling integrative data science, and I'll tell you more about what exactly I mean by that in a bit. But first I want to just give you a little bit of background. So um, first of all, data science at Asana, we have eight of us here still growing. We're responsible for both data science and data engineering here. So that means that we do kind of a combination of defining metrics, building models, running analyses that drive product and business decision making. But, and we're also building the tools and infrastructure for our ETL pipelines, experimentation, dashboards, and so forth. So a uh, really broad set of things that we're doing on the team. Uh, I've only been here for about six months, so I'm one of the newer members of the team. Um, previously, I was at uh, Facebook. I was part of the core data science team there and also led a user experience and market research team that focused on international growth. So got to travel to some really interesting places as part of that. Um, spent a few too many years in school, so my background includes a lot of different things, some information science, computer science, social psychology, human-computer interaction. Um, so that's me. I want to share a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight. So we have this talk and then a panel with some folks from Asana. Um, so for this talk, I'm going to speak about a few different things here. So first, the design behind so-called organic data. Again, more on that in a second. Uh, a couple stories of metrics design that I've, that I've seen uh, at Facebook and Asana. Um, a notion of sort of what is integrative data science in practice. What do I, what do I mean by this? And a bit about the sort of inductive, deductive cycle for kind of generating, generating insights from data. So first I want to share with you this quote from uh, Bob Groves, who's the former director of the US Census Bureau. So it, Bob Groves says, society has created systems that automatically track transactions of all sorts. For example, internet search engines build data sets with every entry. Twitter generates tweet data continuously. Traffic cameras digitally count cars. Collectively, society is assembling data on massive amounts of its behavior. And indeed, if you think of these processes as an ecosystem, the ecosystem is self-measuring in increasingly broad scope. We might label these data as organic, a now natural feature of this ecosystem. So this was a paper that he wrote in Public Opinion Quarterly in 2011, sort of distinguishing uh, this notion of organic data from what he, what he calls designed data, which is sort of more traditionally what we get from experiments or surveys or something where we're like constructing the process that generates the data in a more deliberate way. But what I would argue is that this distinction and this notion of organic and self-measuring systems is actually kind of problematic in the context of the practice of data science. So the reason that I find this notion of organic data problematic is that the, the, the choice of what data to log and how to construct metrics of interest from it, it's not automatic. It's not an obvious or some kind of natural consequence of the behaviors or the technological infrastructure. It's something that, that we do. Um, so some logging you know, is built into web servers, but with modern web applications, the you know, HTTP request logs by themselves are not really sufficient for most purposes. They don't give us any kind of higher level understanding. So they need to be augmented with semantically meaningful data, or they need to be aggregated in specific ways based on some kind of deeper understanding of the application logic and the context in which it's being used. So you know, data scientists and software engineers often work together to design logging systems and semantics that meet specific needs, whether they're you know, operational needs, scientific needs, business needs. And as with any sort of design, it's, you know, metrics can be created for different purposes and to emphasize different outcomes, to tell different kinds of stories. So we'll talk about some examples of this in a minute. But first, I just want to touch on you know, where does the motivation for metrics design come from? Why do we design metrics in one way and not another? So uh, you know, a common, it, may, it might follow from you know, business needs. We often say, well, we're, you know, we're designing metrics to meet business needs. Um, a common metric for people who make apps and websites is the number of people who use their product. But even a seemingly sort of straightforward metric like this can be kind of nuanced. So is it the number of people who've ever used the product? or the number of accounts registered, or the number of people currently active, over what time period are they active. And people can define this notion of active in different ways too. Do you merely have to sort of visit the site? Do you have to take a particular kind of action there? 
um, maybe do something visible to other people. What about programmatic access via an API or some, some kind of automation? You know, if a, if a smart thermostat sends out a tweet via if this, then that, did the owner of the thermostat take some action? Is that, is that legitimate activity? So <laughs> with these questions in mind, um, I would like to talk a little bit about um, two sort of stories of metrics design. One from Facebook, uh, where we designed new metrics for Facebook groups, and one about the redesign of core metrics at Asana. So I worked on Facebook groups for about a year. And when I started, we had some basic metrics about groups that were only sort of minimal transformations of what, you know, what we would get from the production data store and the server logs. Things like how many members are in the group, how many posts and comments are there, how often is a group visited, things like that. So these allowed us to tell a high level story about activity in groups, like the you know, number of monthly active users in groups overall or in a particular group but it didn't give us much insight into which groups were successful and why, or what's happening in different types of groups. I mean, one of the things we've seen since is, you know, now there are for sale groups on Facebook. There are all sorts of different use cases that nobody thought of when groups were first created. Surely there's some signature for things like that in the metrics. Um, so we did some brainstorming, uh, you know, cross-functionally we worked with the, you know, product designers, engineers, PMs, data scientists, UX researchers. We did some brainstorming. We did some survey and interview research with both the users of groups and people who create groups, the founders of groups. And we came up with some ideas for new metrics that might help us understand sort of which groups were more likely to be successful. Um, you know, just some examples that we were talking about were things like what fraction of group members visit every week or every day in a given group? Uh, what fraction of these visitors actually contribute some content, like a post or a comment? Um, sort of the social network within groups, how many members of a group are friends with each other, how many social ties exist within a group. Um, what does the group, what does the group's founder do, especially in the early days, of, you know, when the group is first created? How often do they visit the group? How often do they engage in conversation or take some action like moderating a post? Um, so at this point I should say another important thing to know about Facebook groups is that most of them die. And what I mean by that is that most of them are inactive within a few months of being created. So I actually think this isn't that surprising. I suspect this is true for a lot of accounts and entities on a variety of online services. You know, people create a new account or a profile all the time and never come back to it. I'm sure we can all think of examples of ourselves doing that. Um, so people create a group to try it out. Maybe they add some friends, but it never really takes off. So a key element of sort of our thinking about this was to figure out which of these potential new metrics actually had some relationship to the survival of a group over a, you know, a longer period of time. Um, so to do this, we took the metrics I mentioned and a number of others and fit a proportional hazards model to see which of these candidate metrics were most predictive of group survival. Um, it turned out the actions of the founder early in the group's history turned out to be some of the most important predictors. And the group's team ended up adopting several of these metrics as key indicators to track over time. So um, one reason I'm able to share so much detail about this process is also that we published a paper about this. So I was working with uh, Professor Bob Kraut from Carnegie Mellon, who came and did a sabbatical with us uh, back in 2013. So some of this work you can read more about in our paper in Computer Supported Cooperative Work 2014. I'm uh, happy to provide a link to that if anybody's interested. So that's sort of the story with uh, designing new metrics for Facebook groups. Now I want to talk a little bit about the design of core metrics for Asana. So one thing I should say here, as I mentioned, I've been here for about six months. This work was done by data scientists on the team, Chris and Aaron, uh, well before I got here. So any errors in the retelling are entirely mine. Um, Chris will be on the panel later so we can discuss uh, further uh, with him. So, Original core metrics for Asana were focused around um, visits, so people coming to, you know, coming to the Asana site, and what we call story creation, so basically taking some action that involves creating or modifying some data. So it might be like putting a title in a task, creating a task, completing a task, setting a due date. Um, so basically just some action that means you're using the product in a meaningful way. And our metrics were on a user level basis, these core metrics. 
And one of the key high-level metrics was how many users were weekly visitors who at some point had, had undertaken like a few of these uh, data creation or modification actions in a week. So essentially, they'd used the product in a meaningful way at some point, and also they were coming back weekly. So this is a user-level metric. The challenge here is that a product like Asana is not really about users using it themselves in a vacuum. It's actually about collaboration. So the data science team realized that the previous top-level metrics weren't actually capturing you know, some of the more salient aspects of how people use Asana, how groups of people use Asana. So you know, just counting individual users, unique users, whatever, isn't quite sufficient. We need to be counting groups of users who are collaborating together. So there are two parts to that. The groups part is easy enough. People already use Asana collectively as a team or a company. So we can just say, OK, we're going to treat these teams or companies as the unit of analysis and focus on those. The collaborating together part is a little bit trickier. So how do we operationalize a high-level concept like collaboration? So our answer was to look for user actions that led to the creation of a notification or an inbox story for other people. So that's the key part. So these are the collaboration events that reflect doing work in a way that other people are influenced or made aware or able to contribute. So this is how we operationalize the notion of doing work with other people. Um, some of the other actions that were previously considered like data you know, creation or modification could be things you do in a vacuum. Like you, do, you, know, you title a task, but nobody's on it. Nobody's notified. You know, there's no collaboration possible there yet. So we wanted to refocus on things that involve other people and can bring them into the collaborative process. So then we can roll those events up into counts of how many unique people in a given team or a company are visiting or taking these collaborative actions in a week or in a month. And we can validate these metrics by checking whether they were more predictive of important business outcomes, like you know, whether people might become premium subscribers or how engaged they are with the product. Uh, and it turned out these, these new metrics were more predictive, so we adopted them as our new core metrics. And now they're something that are a key part of what we look at every day. So there are a couple of commonalities that I want to highlight here between the Facebook group story and the Asana core metrics story. So the first is about predictive power, and the second one's about accuracy. So in terms of predictive power, in both of these cases, the teams chose metrics based on their association with some higher level outcomes of interest, whether it's that a Facebook group will survive and stay active, or a company will become an engaged customer. Um, it's important to note here that also that I'm, I'm using predictive in a kind of associational sense, not a causal sense. Ideally, you know, we would hope that the connection is causal, and we can certainly use experimentation. Now that you know, we have metrics in place, we can use the experimentation to sort of evaluate that. But one thing I would argue you know, from these stories is that a minimum bar in vetting metrics should be that they are at least associated with some broader outcomes we care about. Ideally, maybe they somehow have a causal relationship, but at very least are associated. Um, so the other element that I wanted to highlight was accuracy. So I hope you'll forgive me a little bit of a kind of diversion about different types of accuracy. Um, so many of you have probably seen a diagram like this um, in a textbook somewhere or another. Um, in many fields where you know, measurement is important, we have concepts of accuracy and precision. And the definitions vary a little bit here and there, depending on which standards body you look at. But generally, accuracy is considered to be sort of the amount of systematic error, the degree to which we're like capturing or not capturing a true measure of the quantity of interest. So it's not systematically biased or missing some elements or something like that. And then precision is the amount of random error, so how much repeated measurement of the same thing might yield slightly different results. So in a lot of what we do in data science, we can measure things very precisely and often with a high degree of accuracy. Um, this is particularly true when we're doing things that take like a census of, rather than a sample of something like log events. If we're like processing all of them, then there's no sort of notion of sampling error. If done correctly, we should have nearly perfect accuracy and precision. So let's talk about an example here. Um, let's say we want to understand how much work people are getting done with Asana. So we can easily measure, for example, let's say the number of tasks created in the last year in Asana. We could measure this with high accuracy and high precision. We could potentially do exact counts from log data. And that's not to say that there are no threats to accuracy or precision that are possible here. I mean, if the logging's broken and we don't count tasks created with iOS 10, you know, that's a threat to accuracy. We have a systematic bias that will affect our estimates. If our ETL pipeline randomly drops 1% of all log entries, 
uh, that's kind of a threat to precision. It doesn't systematically affect our estimates, but it could lower their precision. But these are essentially, in this context, kind of bugs to be fixed. Like if we found out about something like that, we would just go fix the bug. There's a broader question here, and, and again, apologies for the somewhat tortuous diversion here, but the broader question is whether this metric actually tells us what we need to know. So in addition to these concepts of measurement accuracy and precision, I would argue that there's perhaps a higher level one that's the conceptual accuracy of our measurement. So does our metric actually measure the high level concept that we care about? How much work people are getting done with Asana? You know, maybe this, this uh, in the case of this example, counting the number of tasks created is not actually a very good proxy for that. Maybe a somewhat better one would be number of tasks completed or tasks completed per user or percentage of tasks completed. So, I mean, those are just some simple examples, but driving toward this core concept that we care about and trying to develop metrics that will capture that sort of as, as conceptually accurately as possible. So in both the Facebook and Asana stories that I told, a big motivating factor in developing these metrics was to more closely align our measures with the high level concepts that the product teams and our business partners cared about. All right, so now I'd like to step back to a slightly broader context. Um, one of the things that may come to mind here is we talk about, well, how do you map to these high level concepts? How do we ensure we're measuring the right things? But how do we even know what concepts we should care about? Or what's most salient to understanding the usage of our products? Uh, what are people even doing with our products in the first place? Like, how are they using them? Um, so we often feel like we have this complete behavioral data. Again, we may have a census of all you know, events that occurred in a, of a given type or in a given user segment or something. But that can tell us something about what's happening at a technical level, what's happening you know, with particular interactions. But it doesn't really tell us sort of why and how people are doing what they're doing. Uh, that's often much less clear. And often, that's really important to understand when we're trying to say, OK, what is the right high level concept that we're trying to measure? Is it something like collaboration? Is it something like long-term success of a group of people trying to achieve some particular goal? So I would, I would argue that most practice of data science, either explicitly or implicitly, takes a sort of deductive point of view. So this doesn't mean that we're always working with like formal scientific method and that sort of thing, or that we're necessarily drawing from like capital T theory from, from academia. Um, a theory could be as simple as people who use work tracking software to track their work will get more work done. So from that theory, we can generate a testable hypothesis. We'd have to operationalize work and more and done, but we could do that. Once you've done that, you know, all the usual sorts of data sources and methodological tools apply. You could potentially run an experiment. You could do some kind of observational analysis, somehow, you know, confirm or disconfirm your hypothesis. Um, but there's a piece of this that's often kind of like elided or just assumed in practice. You know, where do these theories come from in the first place? So, you know, working as a data scientist, I've often found like, you know, sometimes the ideas come off the tops of our heads. What do we want to test? Sometimes it's like a PM or, you know, senior executive who says, oh my gosh, we really have to understand X, Y, or Z. Like, how can we test this? So sometimes they do follow kind of naturally from business or product needs. But especially when it comes to understanding more complex behavior in complex environments like Asana or Facebook groups, we often need to kind of develop these theories ourselves and build up our understanding of kind of the higher level phenomena happening in these spaces. So one core principle of user-centered design is you are not your user. So that means that our needs and behaviors as people who are building these systems and often are serious power users of these technologies it's not what most people experience. It's not what most people need. It's not what most people do. We are not our users often. Um, so sometimes we have to sort of turn to other approaches to generate some of these ideas that might lead to th new theories and hypotheses about how people will use a product, what types of behavior people are engaging in. So how do we do that in a systematic way? Well, there is, fortunately, a sort of complement to this deductive approach which is an inductive approach. So in an inductive approach, you know, which is often you see this in more qualitative, qualitative work. So you're starting with sort of raw observations, atomic observations. These could come from interviews, from focus groups, from ethnographies, from open-ended surveys, free responses. And from these observations, 
you know, many different fields have slightly different methods of kind of like derive, like identifying patterns and deriving themes from these sort of raw observations. But what that allows you to do then is start to generate new hypotheses and new theories that maybe nobody had thought of before. Maybe it's an emergent behavior, a new use case for your product that nobody, you know, nobody had anticipated. Um, so, so that's something that, you know, without this sort of systematic approach to uncovering some of these new, new ideas, new potential behaviors, it's very difficult to define the right theories in a sort of top-down way in many cases. So what I would argue is that, you know, for a truly kind of integrative data science, that you really need to have both sides of this cycle. So you have this potentially sort of ideal um, cycle between sort of spending time on inductive approaches and spending time on deductive approaches for a given problem space or product. So what I mean by that is that, there. Uh, what I mean by that is that inductive approaches, so often in industry, this is like UX research, um, generates new theories, generates ideas, testable hypotheses. We can say, oh, we, we didn't know that like, people were doing X, Y, or Z with our product. But now that we know about it, we can design experiments around it. We can you know, look for signals in the behavioral data that, that have been there all along, but we didn't know to look for them. So then we can validate some of these new theories with a quantitative deductive approach with all of the kind of familiar tools. So you know, this is something that uh, both at Facebook and at Asana we have strong collaboration between data scientists and UX and market researchers. And it's a really, really fruitful collaboration. I mean, here at Asana, we've been able to do some cool things looking at like, OK, what are the different archetypes of users who might use Asana derived from UX research? OK, can we find signal for that in the behavioral data? Can we, can we sort of validate and quantify the sort of conceptual notions that arose from qualitative work? And the answer in this case was yes. Similar things at Facebook, you know, working with uh, the internet.org team, we were able to sort of identify, um, you know, so this was an app and a website that was, um, that was made available to people in, in emerging markets to provide sort of free access to new sources of content. And there were all sorts of interesting behaviors around like which services people were accessing and why and like certain interactional patterns that we didn't anticipate. You know, looking at the behavioral data, it's totally unclear sort of what's going on, why are there like cross-national differences in how people are using the app. But as soon as we started doing field research and sending people out to observe real users in context using this product, we were able to come back and immediately sort of say, oh, let's look for like X, Y, and Z behaviors in the log data. And sure enough, we were able to find many of them. So we were able to define some new key metrics just based on kind of the intuition and observation from you know, taking a qualitative field approach as well. So my sort of platonic ideal of this cycle is that you know, as data scientists, we do work closely with cross-functional partners. And sometimes it's research. Sometimes it's like a PM with great product intuition who is like, hey, have you guys thought about it this way? You know, can, can set you off in a new direction. So I think this kind of collaboration, this kind of cyclical iteration can lead to dramatically better sort of product results and dramatically more insightful uh, you know, approaches to data science, metrics that better sort of drive that success. So I will leave it at that. Happy to take questions. Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Sharmista. Sorry, this may be like a very basic question, but um, I did some inductive sort of research just recently. It was my first time ever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know what kind of tools or processes you use to do that because given that you have a lot of textual information, mm -hmm. um, was Facebook or Asana using any sort of tools, or is it basically just you parsing through and trying to develop themes? Mo most of the, thanks for the question, and most, most of the, um, research, the qualitative research that I've been involved with, and this was more at Facebook where I was on a sort of mixed methods team for a while, um, you know, it was more like looking at interviews and transcripts and doing some kind of like inductive coding, often like whiteboard stickies or something like that to sort of identify themes. I mean, a common thing is like having multiple independent coders. So if you've got like a bunch of interview transcripts or videos, have several people go through them in parallel and see which themes they identify. And then like they get together and reconcile their themes if they disagree and then iteratively define like what are the high level themes that you want to take away from that. 
There are definitely like some specific tools to support that sort of text analysis, like in vivo is one of them. Um, I can't remember any others off the top of my head, but yeah, that's something that's definitely common in, in a lot of like academic research as well. Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, so there was one situation that you mentioned, and I'm curious uh, to know more about it. Mm -hmm. You said, as an example, you were interested in finding out, uh, depending on the type of people who start out a group, mm -hmm. the longevity of the group could be you know, predicted based on that. Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that there would be a whole bunch of different attributes when you're trying to figure out the longevity of a group. Let's say you define it as greater than six months, greater than a year, whatever it might be as the end result. Yeah. With all these different attributes, do you like control for each one when you try to measure the predictive power? Or were you using certain techniques or tools that would kind of you know just take the whole data and crunch through it and then try to come up with this? Yeah, I mean there are a lot of different techniques you could use for that. The particular approach we used was a Cox proportional hazards model, which does allow you to like enter multiple variables in at once. Um, so I think the I mean, univariate analyses could also get you to the, you know, to something similar. But obviously, if there are like interesting interactions between them, it's nice to have everything in one big model. Thank you for the talk. Um, I think you've mentioned uh, that you've done a lot of collaboration with designers and, and software engineers and people from other departments. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, like. It, it's, it's oftentimes like pretty hard to kind of transcend like different sectors and work together, right? So, what was like uh, the collaboration like? Was it like how, how frequent was it? What was the actual things that you worked on when you were like, maybe when you guys gathered at at a, uh, at a meeting room? Um, it's a good question. So. I think it depends a lot on the, you know, the stage of a product and the type of product you're talking about, like when that collaboration makes the most sense. I think often like earlier in the lifespan of a product, like more qualitative research is often done and it can help set the design direction for the final product or for future iterations of the product. And I think that's a really good time for data scientists and qualitative researchers to get together and talk through like what are the key things to measure, what are the types of behaviors we expect and how can we look for signals in the metrics that will give us some idea of when people are successfully doing the thing we think they're going to do. Um, now you also have to be open like once a product gets out into the field that maybe people will do some unanticipated things. Um, Facebook certainly is full of this. Asana, we're always surprised by the awesome and creative things that different, different customers do with it that we didn't think of. Um, so I do think it's also important like as time goes along to sort of check in and make sure you understand the full scope of use cases and behavioral patterns and stuff and often some periodic qualitative work combined with then sort of following up with data science to figure out uh, how can we look for the signal in the log data is super important. I would say like some of the specific collaborations that I can think of that were particularly fruitful were like where we say combine survey data and log data. Um, thinking of some examples from Facebook where um, we would run a survey to get some kind of attitudinal um, information from, from respondents like what do they think about X, Y, or Z feature, or what are they doing with it, what value do they get from it, and then be able to sort of tie that back in an anonymized fashion with like some summary data about how they were using the product. And that gives us kind of the two sides of this, like both what they think and also what are they doing. So I think that's a really powerful technique and a good opportunity for that collaboration. We're going to take one more question and then we'll get started with the panel, but feel free to hold your questions for the panel. When you did the surveys, uh, did you just rely on uh, whoever want to answer like a convenience sample, or did you use techniques from uh, political polling trying to rebalance people, mm -hmm. uh, your sample? Yeah. It, it, depend, it depended on the survey, but sometimes, yes, we did use different sort of uh, weighting techniques. Um, the I would say, I mean, for online surveys, obviously it's very difficult to, um, to get around that kind of self-selection bias. Uh, you know, online surveys often have a really low response rate, so you can you know, weight the respondents to match some kind of, uh, some kind of you know, known distribution of the, of the whole population. But often when the response rate is that low, it can be a little bit challenging because you're just not going to get any representation of certain groups. Um, fascinating article recently about the USC uh, political polling and one outlier who's like been skewing the results for months. Um, because he has a huge weight. Yeah, exactly. Like young guy, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but at least at Facebook, also we did do some um, we did do some uh, offline sort of traditional survey work as well, especially for Internet.org to understand sort of um, the population of offline users, people who are not yet connected to the Internet. So definitely can't send them an online survey. Uh, SMS polling isn't so great, so we actually did some work there with uh, um, more traditional vendors who sent people, you know, sent enumerators into the field to survey people in person. Thank you, Thank you all so much.